morning, church. We are continuing our, our series in Jonah, and we've now come to Jonah chapter 3. Now hear these words. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and the nobles, no human being or animal or herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed. They shall not drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind, and he may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and God did not do it. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Move freely about us, we pray. Leave the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in you, to you, as we ponder the depth of your love for us. And we hear the call to be your church, to bear witness, to offer hope. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. Jonah is not a book of the Bible that is often preached on a Sunday morning in worship. In my 27 years of ministry, I can recall preaching on the story of Jonah one time. And I'm not referring to my sermon two weeks ago. I had offered a short sermon series on Jonah as a build-up to the children offering a cantata based on this story of Jonah and the whale. Pastor Tim had set the series for actually the first week, first month of July uh, that I was here, and, and, and we had done some work, the church had done, on setting up a, the small group study guides. And so I wanted to honor the work that had been done so that we are continuing to do Jonah's story, only we push it back a little while. Now, if we were to follow the prescribed text on any given Sunday, which is another way of, of saying the lectionary text, the lectionary text are, are texts from the Old Testament, the Psalms, an epistle lesson, and the gospel lesson. And they're prescribed for every Sunday for a, a three-year cycle. So that means that sometimes pastors will come in and they'll look at the Old Testament lesson and they'll say, no, I'm going to preach the gospel this year, and, or I'm going to preach the epistle. And so even though Jonah is there, it's only there once in the whole three-year cycle. We may go nine years and not hear a story from the script, from the pulpit uh, and the proclamation from Jonah. See, Jonah chapter 3 is the only part of Jonah that's in that prescribed lectionary text. So, yes, we may never hear it, uh, and yet here we are. We're, we're four Sundays going to be in the series of Jonah. It's four Sundays in a row, and it is a great story even as it is so different. Is it not? It is so different from the other minor prophets included in the Old Testament. Now, I do think we often reserve the story of Jonah, not in worship, but we reserve it for Sunday school or children's church. And not just any level of Sunday school. We tend to reserve it for children's Sunday school. For some reason, we tend to reserve certain stories that deal with animals to children's ministry. Did I say that the cantata that we were preparing for in a different church was done by the children of the church? I mean, aside from the rather spectacular offering at the Sight and Sound Theater in Pennsylvania, have you ever heard a, a, an adult choir offer a cantata 
on Jonah? I'm guessing not. See, sometimes we reserve certain stories like the creation story or, or Noah and the flood with the animals going two by two, two by two, and then the story of David and Goliath, and not that Goliath is an animal, a different kind of animal, and, and Jonah being swallowed in the belly of a fish for children. We reserve such stories for children as if we get to a certain age and we age out on those stories. You know, we often, again, when we get the teenage years, that's when we start to question a lot of the things that we read in Scripture. And that's usually about the time we're inclined to do what? To dismiss some of the stories because something about them makes us uncomfortable. That it, something about the story just doesn't make sense and we can't wrap our rational minds around the story. And so we ask some questions of certain scriptures like, did this really happen? Did this really happen? And when it comes to Jonah, it's not the message of repentance that makes some people uncomfortable. And yet I hope the message of repentance makes us a little, at least a little, uncomfortable. Because it should make us uncomfortable because we should hear something about the urgency to walk with God, to go with God, to, to take up certain practices and seek to bless God in the way that we are living our life because we know that God has blessed us. And so we want to add certain spiritual disciplines that will help aid us in the act of repenting, to take up certain practices like worship and devotional reading and prayer to aid us on the way of repentance. But our sense of being uncomfortable with the story comes not from the word repentance or turn, but comes with either feeling like we must take this story literally because after all, it's where? It's in the Bible. Or if we doubt such could ever happen and we admit such, then people may start to question how we read the scriptures. And they may even question the sincerity of our faith. And I don't know about you, but I don't like it when my faith comes into question. Someone might proclaim, nothing's impossible for God, and that's true. And that ends the discussion because if some, nothing is impossible with God, then Jonah could have been swallowed up by a big fish. See, we're taught to take the scripture seriously, and I hope every last person here in the sanctuary and those who are worshiping in line, I hope we all take scripture very seriously. And in doing so, we don't often know what to do, though, with a story like Jonah being swallowed up by a big fish only to be spewed up on the land after three days. Spewed up. That's just a more pleasant word than Vomit. You know, I, I should like this story. I get to say vomit from the pulpit. We shouldn't have sent the kids away. Bring the kids back in here so they can hear me say the word vomit and throw up. See, if we take it literally, we're going to get the intended message. If we take it metaphorically, we're going to get the ten intended message. But if we take it literally, we'll get the intended message, yes, but we may get lost in the story in such a way that the Hebrew writer never intended for people like you and me to ever get lost in. Instead of accepting the story for what it means, we might think we have to defend it. We have to defend it when I'm pretty sure the story does a great job on its own. It doesn't need for us to defend it's scriptural integrity. You know, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story that speaks about a merciful and loving God. It's a wonderful story that tells us about the nature of God. It's also a wonderful story that speaks about us as human beings and that we have that need from a merciful God, the grace that abounds. It also tells a story about just who our merciful God desired to reach out to and also encourages us as the church today 
to be a people who are willing to share our faith with those who know not faith. And so we, like Jonah, hear that call to go and proclaim a good a hope and good news. So as we look at Jonah, I simply ask that we hear the story with fresh ears and that we hear the story in, in such a way that we are hearing a timely message from these ancient words of truth. See, I hope we don't ask questions of the scriptures that the scriptures never intended to answer. For such questioning only serves as a distraction or complicates things, can complicate what is truly a great story of God's mercy and grace, whether you take it literally or not. Now, the statement I'm getting ready to make, I realize is a dangerous statement, but I don't care. I don't care if you take this story literally. I don't care if you take it metaphorically. But what I do care is when someone belittles another person who receives the story and understands the story differently than you. Either way, I hope we can hear God speak a word of what? Grace. A divine grace. And I hope we can hear a word of urgency and a word of hope, even from Jonah, who was reluctant to offer a word of hope, who actually doesn't even speak a word of hope as he proclaims a message to the people of Nineveh. You know, thus far in the story, we have an understanding that God didn't give up on Jonah. Isn't that wonderful? If God doesn't give up on Jonah, that means God is not ever going to give up on you and me. God will never let us so go so deep away from him, from God, that we don't, can't experience God's love and grace. You know, the first two chapters don't reveal how disappointed and upset and angry God is with Jonah. Rather, it tells a story of a merciful God who will not let Jonah go deeper than the love that God has for Jonah. And Jonah is given a second chance. As we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, Jonah tried to run the opposite direction to Nineveh, of Nineveh. Tarshish represented the one place that a person could go that would be the furthest away from Nineveh and also the place where someone could go to hide from God. Jonah was on the run. He'd rather die than go and proclaim a message to Nineveh. After all, he asked the sailors on the boat, throw me into the sea, which meant he thought he would die and be released from the call that God had on his life. And we know how the story's going. God hasn't given up. God is not finished with Jonah, and the big fish swallowed him up to rescue him from the raging seas. And there he was in the belly of the fish for how many days, church? Three, And the number of three is significant here. As Christians, we know the number of days to be significant because Jesus died and rose from the grave after how many days? Three. And that's why we might think it's significant. But we got to go back to understand the significance of the three-day period. See, the reason why there is this three-day period was back then a person wasn't considered dead or declared dead until after three days. Three days of no movement, just to make sure that the body wasn't in a coma or some deep sleep with a fever or some other ailment. Three days. Three days, whereas Jonah in the belly of a whale. Here in the story, Jonah is dead in sin. Why? going away. He's going away from God. In three days, though, he was given new life and an opportunity to go in the direction that God had called him to go and do the very thing that God wanted him to do. Now, as Christians, we love the the Easter story, do we not? That's our story. When we read about the story of Jesus, he was in the tomb for three days, meaning he wasn't just lying there and was resuscitated Not partially dead, no. Jesus was full on dead. And Jesus had, though, been declared dead while he was on the cross, and his lifeless body was laid in the tomb for three days. 
What happened on the third day? The third day he rose from the dead. And Jesus, the one who died for the sins of humanity, was raised to new life. And so here in the Old Testament, in the story, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, and then he was spewed out. Can I say vomited again? (laughs) And there's the theme in the Old Testament, a theme of death and resurrection. Right there in the Old Testament. And in this story, Jonah is given a second chance where we hear how the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. See, chapter 3 and chapter 1, they begin with the the same words in very much the same way. God calls Jonah, tells him what to do. First chapter, Jonah fails. Not good at it at all. And now he has a second chance in life. This time, Jonah had been delivered from the grip of death, was given new life. His running away from God was now over Jonah, who'd been on the run, was now invited to run direction all along that God wanted him to go, this time with a second chance. Jonah does as God instructed. At this point in the story, all we hear is that he went and he proclaimed a message of judgment. He proclaims a message of judgment. I find it interesting that in the story, at least as it's coming to us in chapter 3, it's not laced with any hope at all. Jonah's just offering a word of judgment, of coming doom. It's not like the second chance prophet is speaking a word to the people in the hopes that they would actually turn and take up a second chance in life. See, other prophets like Isaiah were called to offer a word that would confront people. Prophets would hold up the mirror and say, this is what God sees. Do you see this? And there might be a time of judgment and punishment, but ultimately there's a word of hope saying we can now return to the Lord and walk in the way of righteousness and walk in the way of holiness. So yes, there's repentance offered, but it's also with the word of hope. But now in Jonah, there's a prophetic call from Jonah to encourage people to return to the Lord, or in this case, to turn to the Lord. It's a message that we would think Jonah would love to share with people he did not like. Jonah's proclamation is this, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I can see Nineveh, I mean, Jonah, you know, popping some popcorn, looking out over, just waiting to see what he's just proclaimed. He doesn't like the people. (laughs) I'm just going to watch it all unfold. You know, in a sports, a team may be losing greatly at halftime. We've seen this a lot in sports. And I would imagine some coaches during halftime or in between certain periods will bring the team together and they'll come up with a different strategy so that they might at least get back in the game and and save some face at least, you know, offering a different game plan because what they were doing before was disastrous. It wasn't working. And we've seen teams come out after make, and make adjustments and get back in the game and actually win the game. And how many times have we heard a commentator, a sports commentator say, I wonder what the coach said at halftime. It's a completely different team. Something she said obviously worked. Jonah doesn't appear to be the type of prophet who's going to encourage different results. He's not there to give the people of Nineveh a pep talk. We wouldn't want Jonah as our pastor. If Jonah were a coach of a team losing greatly in the game of life, he would say something like this. People, you stink. I know you stink. The owner knows you stink. The fans know you stink. And by now, you know you stink. And you've got 30 more minutes to get right out there <laughs> and continue this stink fest. And then it will be all be over. 
Yet even though the words of turn the Lord to repent were never uttered from this unique prophetic voice, there's a great turnaround. There's a great turnaround, not just of a select few, but from everyone and everything in Nineveh. Now, there was no such king of Nineveh, even though that's what we read. There was a king of Assyria who would not have resided in Nineveh. Most likely who resided there was a governor. But it sounds more impressive when the king issued the decree, not a governor. It carries more weight. And so the idea of a king making the proclamation of a fast, the use of sackcloth and sitting in ashes, were tangible signs of remorse among everyone, even the animals. It was a way of showing to not just Jonah, but to God, everyone from the top down were there to, retur- to turn from evil so that God might relent from punishing, that they might change, and there might be evidence of repentance. So all were to change their ways in the hopes that God would relent from punishing, that God would change God's mind. After all, the king says, who knows? Well, now let's just do this thing. Who knows what will happen? Jonah's message was what? 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And even though we're not in the season of Lent, such a message from Jonah to me has a very Lenten feel because Lent is a period of 40 days where we hear the call to turn or to return to the Lord, to give up certain practices, to add certain practices like fasting and abstinence and self-denial and focus more on God in the hopes of growing closer to God and experiencing more blessings from God in this life as we seek to walk with greater purpose and intentionality. Now, we're not in the season of Lent. Rather, we are in what is commonly known as the ordinary season. It's a long season from the first Sunday after Pentecost all the way to November, right before we experience Advent. We're in this ordinary season. And I hope that as we are in this ordinary season, that what is ordinary for you and for me, what's ordinary for us as a church, that we are seeking daily to turn to God. And to live lives worthy of Christ's sacrifice, of his dying for our sins so that we might have life and to have the abundant life that Christ calls us to live. That we might bear fruit worthy of repentance. No matter what season we are in or when we hear words of proclamation, I hope we would be like the king and the peoples of Nineveh and be as serious as they were and seeking to change their ways as a result, living more in line with God and living the Christian life. For we hear in the scriptures that God is a holy God and God calls us to be a holy people. And not one of us have arrived at that. Not one of us has achieved achieved perfection in the Christian life. And so there's always opportunity to turn and be better at this thing called living the Christian life tomorrow than we were at this yesterday. And I hope that as we journey forward always, the next day and the next day after that, we are journeying, 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 I can say that word, and I'm online, you'll hear this forever, uh, that we will walk with God always. How about that? You can tell that wasn't written down. <laughs> yes, there's always an opportunity to turn to the Lord. And who knows? Who knows how many blessings you will receive from God as we turn to God and follow the teachings of Jesus? When the people of Nineveh turned to the Lord, it was meant to be a lasting change, not just a 40-day period of let's give up something only to celebrate it again and bring it back into our life. It wasn't a time period of let's pull the wool over God's eyes and then so we can avert being overthrown and then after God will forget about it and we just go back to what we were doing before. Now, we don't hear that they came to have faith. There's no mention of salvation here. But we do read that they turned from the evil ways and God relented from punishing. Such a turning from evil ways was a start to seeking to walk with the Lord. Had they reverted back and the changes were simply temperamental or superficial, a delay tactic, I'm guessing we would have a very different story here or no story at all. 
You know, repentance is not a one-time event that occurred that moment when we had that awareness of God's love for us and we're like, I'm, I'm going with you, God. I, I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm thankful that there are people who can, can recall that day and moment and have that moment where they were walking in sin and they turned and they went with the Lord and they decided to walk with Jesus. Yet repentance, though, is not reserved for that one-time act. It's not reserved for a season of Lent as a means to prepare our hearts for Easter. It's not meant for a time of preparation like in Advent where we're preparing to welcome the coming of Christ like Christmas. Rather, repentance is the ongoing responsiveness to the will of God in our lives. As we daily turn away from sin and choose to embrace the abundant life that Christ our Lord desires for us to live. And who knows? Who knows as we daily turn to God? Who knows the blessings that we will receive individually? Who knows the blessings we will receive as a church as we seek to walk in holiness and go with God? Who knows the glorious things that will happen in life, in our families, in our church, in our community as we take seriously the call to turn to the Lord and bear fruit worthy of repentance. I don't know about you, but I want to live with that kind of expectations about what will be as we seek to walk with the Lord. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.